A new study out of the New England Journal of Medicine has released an alarming study. It found that black and Hispanic individuals are less likely to receive CPR from bystanders than white individuals. The study's senior author is Dr. Paul Chan, who's also a cardiologist at St. Luke Mid-America Heart Institute right here in Kansas City, and he joins us now. Dr. Chan, welcome back to Up to Date. Always good to have you here. Thank you so much for having me, Steve. What prompted you to undertake a study? We were struck by the fact that there are 1,000 cardiac arrests outside the hospital annually in the United States. So there's a huge disease burden. And what's particularly important is that when people have a cardiac arrest, the heart stops and it's an emergency that requires bystanders to respond. And if they get bystander CPR from any individual, their likelihood of surviving to discharge from a hospital is twice as those who don't get bystander CPR. So it's a big deal. It's a huge deal. Yeah. You looked at this issue for when folks are at home and also when they're out in public, doctor. Was there a difference? And there was. You know, what we were particularly interested in was whether if you're black or Hispanic, your likelihood of getting life-saving B- CPR from anyone, a family member at home or a bystander stranger in public, was lower than uh, if you're white. And we hypothesized uh, that if you were black or Hispanic, you would be less likely to get bystander CPR at home because we already know from our prior work that training rates for CPR are lower in black and Hispanic communities. However, what we were interested in understanding in public settings, like the gyms, the airports, on the streets, If you get uh, a cardiac arrest and you're black or Hispanic, we hypothesize that that disparity would be small because there would be other people around, uh, white people, Asians, black and Hispanics, that could provide this potentially life-saving CPR. But what did you find? We found exactly the opposite. Uh, If you're black or Hispanic uh, and you have your arrest at home, you're 26% less likely to get CPR from a family or loved one or friends. That's what we expected around that range. In public, that difference is 37% lower for black and Hispanic individuals. It's even larger than when we have individuals have cardiac arrest at home. That's absolutely crushing. And the other thing that's really uh, remarkable uh, is that this was not just in white communities. We looked at the disparity in public versus at home uh, when the uh, patients were in predominantly white communities where more than 80% of the residents were white race. This was the same in black and Hispanic communities where more than 50% of the residents, like in East Kansas City, are black or Hispanic. That disparity between uh, black and white is greater in public than at home. You know, this study has been published, as I mentioned in the opening, in the New England Journal of Medicine. I can't help but wonder what kind of response you've received to what you've put out. I've received uh, a lot of different responses. Uh, I've received responses from paramedics who've been actually doing volunteer work and training in black and Hispanic communities precisely because it is already known that we don't do enough and there are great barriers to getting CPR training in black and Hispanic communities. Most of the CPR training currently in the United States is done by the American Heart Association and the American Red Cross. However, there are two major barriers. The first is most of these trainings are conducted in white communities, in classrooms, convention centers, uh, in structured settings uh, where black and Hispanic individuals do not live. Why is that? It's more If we know that there's a disparity the opposite way, why are we mostly training uh, folks in white communities? Exactly. It's, 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 it's really uh, a structural problem. Uh, it's probably more convenient because the mannequins are available there. Um, there's more space sometimes, or perceived space. Um, there's also an additional barrier, the cost of getting CPR training. It's not just where it's done, but that it costs about 100 to $200 to do the CPR training. And for many individuals in low-income communities, which happen to lean more black and Hispanic, uh, that's a barrier to mm-hmm. getting training. And, and, and so what we've been trying to advocate uh, in our work uh, with this study and prior studies is that the American Heart Association, the American Red Cross, needs to get out into black and Hispanic communities, needs to do trainings in black churches and Hispanic community centers, needs to make the training either low cost or no cost to ensure equity in access to potentially life-saving knowledge 
that can save your mother, your father, or a, a random stranger. Have the Red Cross uh, or the American Heart Association responded to this study? Not to me directly. Um, I, I know there have has been an interest and there has been the beginnings of work of making CPR training also more inclusive in terms of language, in terms of training materials. And so they've made an effort in the last decade to make the uh, materials more culturally uh, sensitive. But one of the interesting things that I did uh, when we learned about the study results before we wrote it up, if you go to google.com uh, and you uh, type in CPR image, I counted the first 50 images, more than the first 50 images. The mannequin and the bystander are both white. Yeah. So if we do not make the training materials something identifiable for black and Hispanic individuals, it becomes even more of a structural barrier for individuals to think that this is something that they should learn and that this, this, this is something that should occur. Well, the training portion of your study, as you said, this is sort of what you predicted the outcome to be. I'm wondering what the response has been to the other part of your study where you found that out in public, people of color are less likely to get help. It does raise the issue of implicit bias. Uh, How could it not? It, because what's happening in public is more often than not, it could be a, you're a stranger uh, if you have a cardiac arrest. And, and so our response rates may be even more biased, if you will, for a black Hispanic individual as uh, compared to a white individual. In our paper, what we did is we looked at all the arrests in the public location and then looked at if you were black or Hispanic as compared to a white person in a workplace, you're about 27% less likely to get bystander CPR, even if you arrest in a workplace where you're likely to be known by your colleagues. In a gym or an airport where you're probably a total stranger, it's 50% mm. lower. It uh, suggests, again, the familiarity with the individual likely influences response to a black and Hispanic individual, even though it's lower in a workplace as compared to a gym or an airport. It, could there be any other explanation outside of implicit bias? An additional thing that probably contributes is uh, when you call 911, for an emergency, there is a dispatcher on the other end that uh, notifies the paramedics to send an ambulance. In some communities, the dispatchers are trained to provide CPR on the spot to the caller, instructing them to place their hands on the chest and to start pushing down. However, the investments of dispatchers that have that capability are probably larger in white communities and more prevalent. We have no data in the United States as to dispatcher systems at this current mm -hmm. time. If it's even present in a black and Hispanic community, they may not know all the languages that are spoken in that community. And that could explain also some of the disparate responses in those communities, even among, among black and Hispanic communities. So language could be a factor is what right. you're saying. They may not be Spanish speaking or they may not speak a specific uh, African language like Somali or, or Ethiopian or uh, another language that is um, of black immigrants in, in the United States. But what response from the public, from readers of the New England Journal of Medicine doctor have you received? I think a lot of them uh, ex have expressed concern and what I think our study really highlights, it's, it's not just going to ultimately be about training. It is a crucial, integral part of narrowing the disparity, but we need to start thinking that there are other issues involved, whether it's the dispatcher system, whether it's implicit bias in the images and the mannequins and the training materials that we use if you go to google.com. And, and it really highlights that it's going to require a multifaceted approach in order to bridge the gap in training rates and response rates to black and Hispanic individuals with cardiac arrest. You know, you and your team, doctor, laid out some potential solutions to this problem, and I want to go through some of them here. You're already saying that one of them is to be more aware of the kinds of images that are portrayed, showing more people of color who might be involved here. But how do you drive right at the implicit bias uh, problem outside of that? Because that strikes me as something we've been dealing with in this country for a very long time and haven't figured out yet. Right. We need spokespeople who are black and Hispanic uh, to, to carry the message, whether it's from the community, cardiologists, um, emergency medicine, paramedic individuals. Um, we, again, like I said, need uh, uh, materials that reflect the diversity of our country. We also need to make CPR training really uh, 
uh, uh, not a barrier in the, in these communities. Let's make it free, and and let's make it available where they are in black churches and Hispanic community centers, uh, even in barbershops and homeless shelters. And and I think that really begins uh, uh, making a, a huge dent in in what we're seeing as 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 uh, the disparity. You know, Dr. Chan, I'm wondering if in your research you came across examples of people of color who found themselves in a dire situation needing CPR and they simply didn't get the help and support they needed as a way to really put a human face on what you're talking about here. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, I've spoken over the years with many individuals uh, in, in, in low income or in, in black and Hispanic communities where there's just a paucity of, of response. Uh, and, and I think one of the things we can't underestimate is that there's also a trust issue in black and especially black communities of institutions that should be trusted, but we know from the past couple of years that there are issues with activating uh, police um, and, and fire uh, sometimes, yeah. and, and that can carry over to EMS, uh, the paramedics. Uh, what about the role that you think local leaders could begin to play in addressing an issue like this? I, I, you know, we, we have actually had some initial attempts to try to uh, creatively think about, can we reach the whole Kansas City area with CPR training? What if during halftime in the Chiefs game, where most people in Kansas City will watch and most players are black uh, on the Chiefs, um, if they took the lead and demonstrated CPR, it would take two minutes to teach people how to uh, start chest compressions, how to activate 911, and it would go so far in reaching the broader public because so many of us uh, watch the Chiefs, and if they could model with their players uh, with their um, uh, assistant coaches who uh, are black, uh, that would go a, a long way in our community in terms of showing leadership and, and example. Sounds like you need a public service announcement, public service ad to begin to uh, explain this and get it up on TV to show a lot of people Absolutely. what's going on. And what if the cheerleaders participated as well? I think that would really be a fantastic example of um, citizens' role. Um, have you spoken to any uh, local officials about this, Mayor Lucas? Anybody else? Uh, is it on their radar screens? I have not, uh, but I would love to, and, uh, and we're working to to try to c uh, connect with folks. Um, any other thoughts on what we could do to address this here in the Kansas City area in the short term? I think that uh, we need to uh, ensure that uh, folks know that this is a pressing problem. Uh, it affects all of us, and it's not. It's not a heart attack. It's a, a cardiac arrest where literally every minute counts. Mm -hmm. And and so we just need to do a better job communicating how important uh, this uh, CPR can be for, for individuals with it. And it, it will affect our parents and our and I love them. I mean, this is really a striking series of findings that you came up with here. I'm surprised it hasn't gotten more attention. We are continuing to try to reach out to other uh, entities to, to make this uh, known. Uh, and and I, I think that's... Uh, working with the American Heart Association. One of our authors was the vice president of the American Heart Association, and I think we'll continue to work to, uh, through her, uh, Camilla Sasson, uh, and, and others in the American Heart Association to ensure that we can make CPR training even more available in other communities. That's Dr. Paul Chan. He's a cardiologist at the St. Luke's Mid-America Health uh, Heart Institute right here in Kansas City on his findings uh, now out in the New England Journal of Medicine that show that black and Hispanic individuals less likely to receive CPR from bystanders than whites. And uh, again, uh, incredible findings here. Dr. Chan, always good to have you here. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much for your time, Steve. You bet.